Um, my name is Chris McCarthy and I'm the executive director here at the Provincetown Art Association and Museum. This has been a thrilling summer for us, both having Long Point and Motherwell in our space. Um, we have increased our numbers on all fronts from attendance to web hits to memberships, you name it, and it couldn't have been done with two better exhibitions. So I am absolutely proud and thrilled and so happy to see everybody here tonight. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Freddie Schiff Levin Lecture with our artist and master printmaker, Catherine Mosley, for a presentation on Robert Motherwell in conjunction with the exhibition, Robert Motherwell Beside the Sea, on view in the museum's galleries through September 30th. Long Point is actually only up through Monday, so if you haven't seen it or brought your friends to see it yet, please do so. This lecture series was begun in 2003 in honor of the artist Freddie Schiff Levin who was a member of Provincetown's arts community from the 1960s until her passing in 2002. Pam gratefully acknowledges John and Tony Levin who make this program possible through their generous support. We'd also like to thank Liz Lavati and Angel Foods across the street for their continued support for some nice refreshments, like I said, that have to stay on the other side of the museum. Please help yourself um, and enjoy after the lecture is finished. Thank you. Um, our next Freddie Schiff Levin lecture is scheduled for Tuesday, October 16th at 7 o'clock for a panel discussion on the artist Taro Yamamoto, facilitated by Joe Fiorello and Leslie Marchessault in conjunction with the exhibition at PAM on view September 28th through November 25th, 2012. So now to introduce you to Catherine Mosley. Catherine Mosley is an artist who lives and works in New York City. From 1978 to 1991, she was master printer of Robert Motherwell editions in Greenwich, Connecticut. After collaborating with Motherwell on more than 100 editions until his death in 1991, she taught in the visual arts department at Bennington College. She currently maintains a summer studio in the Berkshires. She's represented by AIR Gallery in Brooklyn, New York, and her work can be viewed at her website, katherinemosley.com. Please help me welcome Catherine Mosley. So this is a pic picture of Mr. Motherwell in the print studio on Commercial Street that was next door to the Sea Barn, which was his summer studio. Uh, as you can see, it was right on the water. And there are three prints on the wall in this picture. The first one is uh, Casa de la Mancha, which is this orange one um, on the ground there. Just one second here. I've got to get my lecture moved up. My format. One second. Okay. Okay, then we've got Mexican Night, which is the red and black one, and Persian Two. Now, two of those prints were made from paintings that had been done earlier, and the paintings were huge paintings. So we found a way to they're not copies, but they're, they're, related, they're related prints, and they're all etchings. And if you look at that tray on the table there, that's an actual etching tray, and something is in the acid, but I can't tell you what, because it doesn't look like anything that ever wound up getting addition, but that is being etched. Now this, this I want to talk about this is a lived artiste called Ala Pantura, which was published by ULAE in 1972. And it's a 21 print edition. It's called a book, even though the pages are loose. And it's based, Motherwell, based it on a poem by Raphael Alberti, Ala Pantura, which is about painting. Now, Mrs. Grossman, the proprietor of ULAE had been encouraging Motherwell for years to do a leave d'artiste and she wanted him to use his own writing and he kept saying no I really don't want to illustrate a book of my own writings. Then he happened upon a translation of Alla Pantura by Ben Bellet in a used bookstore in 1966 and as he read it he thought well this is the book. It's all about painting and it's it's perfect for my book. So he told Mrs. Grossman that they would go ahead with the project. And this is one of the pages uh, 
from the book. It's the second to the last page. It's called To the Paintbrush. And what you can see here, what this actually is, it's a soft ground etching of a piece of canvas. And I don't know if you know what soft ground is, but you have a, a soft surface and you can press anything into it, fabric, leaves, various things. So this piece of canvas was pressed into the soft ground and it was etched. And so you can actually even see like the, the staples there. So it's really literally about painting. Now all the text is both in Spanish and English. So the English is in black and the text is in various colors. And all of the text was letter pressed on after the etchings were completed. So when this was published, it was shown at the Metropolitan Museum and it was a huge sensation in the print world. Uh, and so Motherwell was so pleased with the outcome that he really wanted to continue making etchings because he had found a way with Ala Pantura to actually make prints that were more connected to painting. He'd been doing lithographs before that with Hollander and various other people and he just couldn't get the intensity of the color and the actual sort of texture and surface that you can get from etching. So uh, at ULA they worked out a process of using sugar lift and uh, rosin, dusted rosin to make rich grounds and rich black lines. Now this is a proof of a plate that was made for Ala Pantura but it was not included in the book. It was set aside and actually there were copies of it around the Greenwich studio for years and eventually we did make an etching from this where we had to reproduce it and I'll show it again later. Now this is red open with white, red, red open uh, 136. And it's the first, one of the first four prints we did together when we started working in, this was published in 1973. So this was done out in the Greenwich, Connecticut studio. And this is brushed aqua tint ground and uh, sugar lift line. This is one of a series of five prints called the Dutch Linen Suite. They're all heavy, heavy sugar lift etched lines. So sugar lift is a, it's a solution you can make with India ink and sugar and it can be really thick and sticky. And so it's like painting with tar almost. So you can get very rough textured lines. So there are five prints in this series. This is the second one. I'll show you them all. And the thing about this is that it's printed on this paper called Dutch linen. It's a really rough textury paper. So in other words, we didn't need a ground for this because this linen paper actually becomes the ground. It's handmade. It's got bits of rust filings, it's, you know, it's really got a texture. And Motherwell was a paper lover. Uh, so he was always collecting paper. He had stacks and stacks of all kinds of paper. And uh, people would bring him paper because they knew what a paper lover he was. So the paper, we often looked for unusual papers rather than just the standard, you know, French printing paper that you can buy. Now this, uh, I wanted to show you this because it's the first collage print we did. Let me get onto that. It's called Rotandla, and Rotandla is the name of the cigarette label. And to give you a sense of the proportion, the cigarette label is actual size of a cigarette pack, even though it's not an, a real cigarette label. But it's, so it's about Oh, 18 by 20. But anyway, 
Uh, in order to print cigarette labels for prints, they have to be specially printed by an offset printer so that the ink is color fast. So in the meantime, Ken Tyler, who used to be at Gemini in Los Angeles, had moved to Bedford Hills near Greenwich. And he was making lithographs. And he had printed these labels for a lithograph. And so we got the labels from him for this particular collage. Now this is another series we did of the road handle. And this is from the actual plate. Once Tyler was done with it, we took it and printed a whole series called the Rote Handle series. Um, I think there are eight, eight versions of this. They're all different colors. And the, the actual little blue painting was hand done by the artist, which gives them a special touch. Because it's not often that artists actually work on every single print in an edition. So this was done in 1974. This is a picture of the first print studio we had in Connecticut. It was in the basement of the gardener's cottage. And it wasn't this dark. This happened to be a horrible photograph. But you can see there on the wall all the proofs from this series. Uh, I'll go on to the next one. OK. And this one, this is another sort of idea we worked with a lot, which is to take a painting and translate it into an etching. So he had a small painting that was very similar to this. Uh, it was an open, you know, black line, red ground. So we converted it to an etching with the soft ground, uh, the aqua tint, and then um, a line, kind of a line that would be a soft ground line in order to make it look a lot more like a charcoal line. So that's what, what you see um, surrounding the open there. Oops, back. This is called Red C1. Uh, it was done in 1976, and it was uh, published by Harry Abrams, who was doing a monograph on Motherwell, written by Harvey Arneson. And what happened in those days, I don't know if this still happens, is sometimes we do a big edition. This was 100 prints, which had to do with financing the publication of the book. So uh, anyway, so Abrams sells the prints, and somehow they work it out. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, it's the first, we, there were three Red Seas. This is the first one from 1976. And this is really taking that sugar lift and making it liquid so that will, it will actually splatter. This is a studio shot. I think it's from the 80s. But I just wanted to give you a sense of this is the Greenwich studio. How it was always set up with a lot of work. This is a big, long studio, a loft-like studio. And there would be artwork set on both walls, because Motherwell really referenced his own work all along. So you see some elegies. Uh, in the center there, there's uh, a set of prints called the Hollow Man Suite that I'm going to show you a little bit later. Drawings, collages, uh, works on paper. OK, now this is a print uh, called Gesture 3. Uh, it's done in 1977. And we did a series of these gestures. Uh, there's six sugar lifts. And you'll see in the gallery next door that there's another version of this. There's another proof of this uh, in red. Uh, so we wind up with this color, but many, many times we'd proof all of these images in a half a dozen different colors, and then finally choose which one seemed to be the perfect one. These are all about 20 by 24. 
And this blue, we very rarely used this blue, but it's, we called it Motherwell blue. It's like 50% ultramarine and 50% white. And you get this very close to sky blue blue without any hint of green. Okay, so now this, this is interesting. This is called Oyo. I don't know if you can see it says Oyo on that black collage piece. But this was the first actual collage that we did where we, instead of finding the collage element, like a label or something like that, we printed the collage element. So that Oyo, the centerpiece was printed separately and then it was um, adhered to the, the ground. This is from 1978. So the paper is also, in the edition then, you print it every, you know, for every print. So you've got to print it, whatever, 20, 30, 40 times. And then tear it around a template so that the tear shape is actually the same on every print. And this is a, it's not really a print. I mean, what it is is a monotype. So nothing was etched. The whole ground was painted on. So there, when you look at this edition, there's a lot of variation in the ground. And then the, temp, the, the collage piece was torn around a template. Uh, this is called Abyss, and it's from 1978. So this was unique in the sense that we actually just basically painted the ground every time. And, this, and yellow ochre, of course, is a color that he, was a basic color in his palette. Yellow ochre, black, blue, red ochre. He had a very kind of specific palette that he used throughout his entire career. This is a, another collage. Uh, called The Wave, it's from 1978. And this ground is basically a soft ground, a kind of rubbed soft ground. And the, the collage paper, it's a piece of Japanese paper that he happened to have in the studio. So we had to, you know, get enough of it to do this entire edition. Um, it's called The Wave. So he's referencing the sea, even though, you know, it's not the beside the sea but it does connotate the idea of the wave. So this is the second Red Sea, also published by Abrams. Uh, and this one has a really splashy, splashy uh, ground, I mean, it's splashy sugar lift. So we'd actually have to work on, sometimes we'd mix like three sugar lifts. One pot that was loose, one pot, you know, one pot that was thin, one that was medium, and then one that was really thick. So you could really kind of make the whole drawing a combination of splash and uh, heavy, heavy line. Okay, this one. This is called Black Wall. It's from 1981. And it's one of the few real elegy prints that, that we did together. He did a lot of elegy work with Tyler Graphics. So mostly when you see an elegy print, it's probably a lithograph. But this is an etching. And this is also on a very heavy handmade paper. He had some special paper made in France that was, you know, just very textury. And so you don't need a ground with this, as I said, and the, and the edges are irregular. It's just beautiful paper. So this is called Black Wall. It's from 1981. And this, this next one is called Gray Open with White Paint, which sort of connects to the wall idea in the sense that I read this story and I'm not sure. But when Motherwell was in Mexico early on in the 40s, he observed these these Mexicans building adobe houses. And they would build the entire wall and then after it was built, decide where to put the windows. So they could cut them anywhere, they, wherever you wanted a window. So he sort of got this idea then with the opens. Let's see here. 
that that is, we, this is called an open, but an open references the wall and the window. And this one is called gray open with white paint. So the white part is actually, we have to make a little, a little stencil and then put the white paint on every print in the edition. And this is also on a very beautiful textury gray paper. Now these lines are soft ground. So it's not, you know, it's not the sugar lift. What it is is you take a, a soft ground, which is like a Vaseline sort of mixture, and then you can put a piece of paper on top of it and then draw on top of the paper. And then if the paper is rough, it'll pick up a bumpy line that is very similar to a charcoal line. And it can be a fat line. So that's how we get these kinds of lines, because he really did not like etched lines. He didn't really like etching tools or anything that was, you know, sharp. So he really wanted one of these kinds of soft lines that were much more like the way he would draw on his paintings with big fat pieces of charcoal. So here's another one with the same kind of uh, drawing. It's called Red Open with White Stripe. I don't know if you can see on the far left there is a white border that's about an inch and a half wide. And uh, the ground on this, when you see it in person, is very textury. And this covers the, covered the whole sheet of paper. So rather than having a margin, it was, the idea was just to print right to the edge except to leave this one little strip of white so you get a sense of where the paper was. And this is from 1982. Okay, this is called Bloomsday. The title, of course, is taken from James Joyce's Ulysses. And this is in the gallery next door. This is the loan from my personal collection. <laughs> so it's a beautiful print. And the, the calligraphy on this is really, I think, really s spectacular. Just the, you know, sort of the way it's drawn and painted. And it's on a very pale ground, which you can see when you go and look at it in person. There are actually four uh, prints that I'm going to, there are four pieces in the gallery next door that reference the things I'm talking about. Okay, this one is called Running Elegy. It's from 1983. So it's similar to the black wall, except, you know, it does have this wonderful kind of running look where it's splashing off to the, to the right. And it's the only elegy I can think of that, that really does that sort of move off, you know, off in one direction. It's got a lot of, a lot of splatter. So it would take more than one layer of, you know, putting the sugar lift on to get all these textures together. Okay. So this is um, another book that he did. Now this he did with Ken Tyler, and these are lithographs. But it's also, it's an Alberti poem, El Negro. So it's also about painting and the artist and, and using black, the power of the color black. And uh, one of the interesting things about this, another scene, oops, I'm going to go back because, uh, the way this, this is a bound book, but the, the pages fold out, either they double out or they triple out, depending on how big the drawing is. So if you have a copy of this, you're going to have uh, different size pages. Uh, so it's a kind of a wonderful book to actually own. <laughs> and this was, uh, El Negro was uh, like 19, what was the date on El Negro? Let's see. I think it was like 1983. This is the third Red Sea. This is my favorite one. Um, so this is uh, from 1983.
from 1983. The edition was 70. And it's really got, it's, it's very narrow. So it's got a wonderful sort of vertical energy. Okay, oh, this is very hard to see. I'm sorry, this is so, so pale. Uh, this is called Naples Yellow Open. So in person, it's the, the, the Naples Yellow is, uh, it's pale, but it's, it's not this pale. But this was also one that was done from a small painting. Uh, so it's got, actually, it's got three colors. And the, the drawing is the same kind of soft ground. This is from 1984. Okay, now this is a great print. This is Mexican Night. It was done in 1984, and it's related to a painting called Mexican Night from 1979. And the painting is huge. Is huge. Uh, so this is breaking up the ground rather than having a solid ground, uh, you know, etching the ground and, and leaving a lot of the white paper because uh, that's pretty much. It's, it's very similar to the painting if you, if you get a chance to see it. And then this one is the Casa de la Mancha. And this is compositionally related to a painting called the, the Spanish House uh, from 1969. So this one's, uh, there's more variation on this from the original than, than with the Mexican night. This is in the gallery next door. Um, so. And you can really see the brushed aqua tint on, on this. I guess I maybe I haven't explained how the brushed aqua tint works, but what you do is you sprinkle rosin on the plate, coarse rosin, you grind it so it's really coarse, and then brush it and then etch it so you get clumps where it's piled up and then lighter areas where it's, it's thinned out. So you can actually, it's like brushing sand. So it's not one of these just perfect drop box aqua tints. It's, it's hand on. And this I, this is called Black Open 1985 and the reason I'm showing this is because this became uh, something that this edition, I guess it's the, sort of the beginning of this whole idea, I'm going to show you the next, the next one here, of when you print an edition and you sign it, then anything that's left over that's been curated, that's not acceptable, gets torn up. And so we started accumulating, we used to throw them in the garbage can, but then accumulating piles and piles of print pieces. And so this was left over from the one I just showed you. But then of course once you make a new edition of it, then you've got to take that segment and print it all over again whatever, X number of times for each print. But uh, you will see in some ones I'm going to show you next that we really started, instead of taking collage and finding labels, whatever, started making our own collage material out of other prints. And I think this was unique. He hadn't done this uh, with Tyler or Tanya Grossman or, or anyone else. So it's something we really started doing a lot of. It's another studio shot I'll move past. And this is the, this, you know, the version of uh, Green Studio that we printed, we made a new version of in 1985. Now this is what I'm talking about. Now there's one other thing next door that you should look at. It's the original collage that this series, called the Alphabet Series, is based on. So we took that collage, which I think belongs to Renata Ponsold Motherwell, and she's lent it to this exhibition. Uh, reproduced it as best we could. And you'll see in the next. So what we've got that's part of the original is the brown, the black, the red, and the white. And then in the middle of each one, there's a different torn print. So each one is unique, and there are 26, which is why it's called the alphabet series. So in other words, instead of being numbered, they're lettered. It just kind of worked out that way. <laughs> 26, okay, we'll call it the alphabet series. 
So that was a good way to label it. Uh, and you can see there's, it's the next one here. There's one of Casa de la Mancha. There's one of that one I showed you, Perpetual Summer. And bits and pieces, uh, if you ever look at the catalog resume, you'll see. So these were really pulled from that pile of, of torn up prints that I was telling you about. Because each one is unique, so nothing had to be reprinted. They were really just, just there to be used and recycled. And this next one is uh, another collage series. Uh, this was done for the French Revolution. It, it's, it was produced by uh, this art historian, George Soria, who wrote the Grand Histoire de la Revolution Française, and it was done in 1988, and it was the French Bicentennial year. So this is called the French Bicentennial Suite. So you see all those French motifs, fleur-de-lis, but these are really complicated collages. In other words, instead of just one having one collage piece, each one has multiple collage pieces. So I'm going to show you a little bit about how complicated that is. Here we are making just one section of that, printing like that, that French blue. So you've got to make pieces of everything separately for every single print. Here's another. This is this, the Greenwich Studio, and this is another shot. <coughs> Oops. So anyway, you can see them on the wall, uh, the finished ones. Okay. And this is the complete set of the Ulysses portfolio. So the Ulysses portfolio uh, was done in 1988. Uh, it was published by Arian Press in San Francisco, and it's uh, this. This is the port. It was done in a bound book and a portfolio. So the portfolio has the images, and uh, the bound book has the entire text. So these are pages from the bound book. Um, the first six pages. Up at the top, you see a portrait of. James Joyce, which was drawn by Motherwell, which may be the only uh, portrait of a human being he ever drew <laughs> in his career. Uh, so he was an ab strictly an abstract artist. And then you see some of the other pages. Uh, now this, this book took years and years to get off the ground. Uh, his Motherwell really really was hesitant. He thought, I can't illustrate this book. Um, and so he kept calling the publisher and saying, cancel the project. I really don't want to do it. But in the end, Ulysses prevailed. And I came across this, this story about Bob that when he was 20 years old, he'd gone to Paris with his father on the Grand Tour. And they checked into the hotel and then Bob went out wandering the streets of Paris and got into a little bit of trouble, but then he stumbled on the book stalls and bought this pocket-sized version of Ulysses. This is in 1935, when he was 20 years old, and put it in his pocket, and he read it on this tour on, on the, the trains and, and boats that they took. And as he tells it, he read every single word. And for the rest of his life, he never read Ulysses all together again, but that one time he actually did when he was 20 years old. So it really had this deep personal significance for him. And so finally, after about four years, he did a whole series of drawings, and then we chose, uh, I'm not sure how many, about 20, to do the, to do the book. And it got published in uh, 1988. This is um, 
Lament for Lorca, it's from 1991. This uh, was published by the Juan Pratt Gallery in Barcelona in conjunction with an exhibition that Jack Flam organized called Motherwell. Uh, so it was in, uh, in Barcelona. And this is the last print that we did that got signed. So this is from 1991. Now this, after he died, we, did, we had five more prints that were in, in process. They hadn't been editioned, but they'd been proofed and they had been approved. So uh, I spent the next year getting those five editions uh, printed. And this is my favorite one. It's called Lament for Lorca. Uh, no. No. This one's called Barcelona Elegy to the Spanish Republic in 1991. So this was uh, uh, yeah, printed the year in 1992, actually. So, are there questions? Yes. Kathy, um, I, I never knew the formula for Motherwell Blue. I always assumed it was, Robert told me directly, it was uh, uh, ultramarine marine with a lot of white, but I didn't know it was half and half. I th well, I suppose it depends on your ultramarine, but I mean, it, I think it's about, it's about half and half to get at that light. So that, that's an approximation that... Uh, yeah, we weren't, we weren't using measuring cups or anything, but, <laughs> but basically you pour this and you pour that and, and stir, stir it up. About the um, open series, the windows, um, you know, they're not really open, they're sort of open windows, and it's not really open. Well, it was this idea of being in Mexico and then watching these oh, Mexicans oh, build these oh, adobe oh, 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 well, it was this idea of being in Mexico and then watching these oh, Mexicans build oh, these adobe, windows, right. these adobe buildings. But now, with the open series, it goes like this. Um, but there are some where it's the opposite, where it's like a door, where the lintel was on top and the threshold was open. What do you know about that? It, it, was that a conscious distinction between the window and the door? Well, I think, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I had heard also, they, he would start flipping upside down and it would, you know, a door would turn into a window. But most of the opens do come down from the top. Yeah. But you uh, know, Motherwell's uh, friend and the poet Stanley Kunitz used to say the ending of a poem should be both a window and a door. So, and they were very close. So it's just interesting to talk about it. Well, it was a big th theme. Yes? Could you just say something about your background and how you met him, how you started out? Well, okay. <laughs> I grew up in the Midwest and I came to New York in early 1970. Uh, I was planning to go to graduate school, but I started, I started off at this printmaking workshop, Bob Blackburn's printmaking workshop, which is where you went if you went to New York and you wanted to make prints. And so I was there for a couple of years. And just then it was kind of a, in the 70s, it was a whole different time in New York where people really hung out with each other. And I met a lot of people. Uh, and a friend of mine was working with a framer, Dane, Bob Dane of Dane Schiff. And he had a print shop. I mean, he had a frame shop on the Upper East Side. And the story is that Bob Motherwell loved to get his art framed. He framed, he just loved having everything framed. So he had a gigantic framing bill with this guy. And he said, listen, let's forget the framing bill. I want to make some etchings. So he found me through this, this friend, and he brought me out to Greenwich, and we thought we were going to do a couple of editions just to get the ball rolling. And it just never stopped. So. <laughs> So it was one of those, you know, serendipitous things. Yes? Can you tell me what you attach the collage pieces with in terms of the glue? Um, well, we experimented a lot. Mostly we would use, we use this archival glue called, called jade. Uh, you've got to thin it down. Because it, since then, I mean, I've experimented. I use a lot of collage myself. And, I've found other ways to do it. But it has to be thin enough that it doesn't shrink. So it, it gets very tricky. It works fine for small pieces. 
and it really does adhere. But the paper behind it, uh, it's tricky if you're, if you're adhering on something that's already got an oil-based surface. So also you have to use a lot of pressure. Yes? Well, actually, I was usually only here for three to four weeks. And he would come to the studio in the afternoon, and we just talk about things. And uh, we didn't actually, we actually, we made plates here. We didn't actually do much printing. We made some proofs. So it really wasn't, it didn't require that much time. Just on a daily basis, maybe an hour in the print studio would be enough to. Uh, you know, make a drawing. And we also did a lot of collage work uh, in, this, in the print studio. So it was kind of a, not really so different than Greenwich. You know, where you'd have a studio, uh, a whole schedule of lunch, the mail, uh, seeing friends, coming to the print studio, meeting other people, painting. He liked, he liked to paint in the evening, so basically when, in Greenwich, he wasn't painting during the day. Uh, he'd wait till everybody left, the studio assistants and everybody, and that's when he would go to the studio. Can you walk us through just a little more detail about the process of doing these collage etchings? Um, I mean, in other words, I guess I'm curious, all of them are multiple or are they each uh, Well, that alphabet series, each one is unique. Okay. Now, if there was one where we were going to do an addition from a, a collage piece, we'd have to go back to the original plate and just print up that portion of the plate big enough to get to print it and then just run that piece like that black open that was a piece of that perpetual summer. Just enough to get um, the 30 or 40 pieces that you need for the addition. And then tear them all down so they're all the same and then, then glue them on. So, so it really depended. Down, so the turning them down, how do you make them all the same? Okay, well there is a trick actually. We, do you know what a, a, how thin an aluminum litho plate is? Okay. Well that's almost like a scissor, so we cut the template out of that and then tear against it. So it's almost like, you know, you've got this perfect metal sharp edge and you can tear kind of a perfect uh, piece every time. <laughs> but you wouldn't know that if you weren't in a place where there were these old litho plates lying around that also would go into the garbage, but they'd turn out to be handy. Yes? No, the ground is printed first under, like, if, if it's one of those, if it's a colored aqua tint with a sugar lift line, the ground is basically a rectangle of, of the color. But if it's a brushed aqua tint, it's, it's got a lot of nuance because there are thin and thick areas because of the way the rosin has been brushed away. So you can actually see see that variation. So it looks like a kind of sandy uh, painted ground. So in that series, if you had 20 of them lined up, they would all look slowly different? No. The, all, the, all the prints in the edition would be identical. Because the plate, it's etched in the plate. So the plate holds the ink the same way every time. If, uh, unless it's a hand on one. But that was but very rare. <laughs> I mean, there was only one where the whole ground was just hand painted. That was the, yeah, that's, that's, what I'm about. Yeah, that's the only one. So that one, there's a lot of, we call that an addition verrier. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so you don't expect it to be all the same. You're not, you know, misleading anybody. It'd be, it's, it's... Yes? Was the print uh, individually designed for the plate as a signature? 
Sometimes the, the prints are always signed, even if there's a signature in the plate. He would Some, sign them? He would sign them, absolutely. Every print is signed. So signing in the plate, but sometimes he'd initial in the plate, just, um, I mean, just because it was just part of making the plate, it really had nothing, it, not to do with this is part of the addition. So the, when it's signed, it's also numbered. So you know exactly how big the addition is and how many prints there are. Yes? Another question. Uh, where you showed the one where it's, uh, the black looks like the charcoal line. Yes. Uh, I guess it was one of the The open, that gray with the white paint? Right. Exactly. Yes. Uh, how again, you, you, described, you described it as a very thin paper that you draw. No, no. You put this uh, soft ground, uh, that's like yes. hard ground with Vaseline in it, so it's sticky. And then if you put a piece of sort of textury paper on top, don't, don't press it down, and then you draw with a pencil, you're actually pushing the texture of that paper into the soft ground, and you're picking up this soft ground. So when you etch it, you get all those little you know, bumps that makes it look like a charcoal line. If you were to use a different kind of instrument, it could be a, you know, a clean line. It just, it's just a way of getting something on the fuzzy side. <laughs> yes? This is a hard question. What was it like to be with them to work with them? It was a joy, actually. I worked with them, it was 19 years. We never had uh, a negative word. It was, So it was a very rewarding experience. We just sort of started and, and kept and you know never stopped really till the end. Uh, Did yes. he help you at all with your own work when you were pursuing the other look at or critique anything that you were doing on your own? Um, not really, but he did help me get into graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with an amazing letter. <laughs> <laughs> he was well educated himself. Yes, wasn't he? very. I understand he was very articulate. He studied philosophy. So, I, if there are no more questions, I guess. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>